Uh, welcome to the 2002-2003 Science Technology Study Lectures. My name is Terry Bristol. I'm the president of the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, and it's the institute that organizes this. Uh, it's my pleasure at this point to thank the co-sponsors who made this possible. Uh, in particular, our lead co-sponsor this year, Mentor Graphics Corporation. Yeah. And then uh, Oregon Episcopal School, elect they're going to be here, they're here. <laughs> no. We don't have to clap on all these, but it's okay. Uh, Electro Scientific Industries, Oregon Public Broadcasting, who's been with us all the time. Uh, the Oregon University System, and I'd like to say I think that Richard Jarvis, who's the new chancellor, is here, and uh, I'm, I want to be his new best friend because he's a major supporter of this uh, program for all the universities and campuses. Can I say yes? <laughs> Uh, and then Portland, Portland State, Western Oregon University, University of Oregon, Oregon State University, all those campuses have contributed. Portland Community College, Mount Hood Community College, and Clark College in Vancouver are all uh, co-sponsors. And also I'd like to thank uh, some underwriters, Morgan Stanley Funds, IDC Architects, and Virtual Design Networks. Uh, when we, just a couple of things. There is when we go to the Q and A. There's uh, if any of you who haven't been there before. There's a microphone on that side, microphone there, microphone up above. We'll do that. There's also these cards, and I, I have to make this pitch again on the cards because it's so much easier to send out a, an email uh, to you guys than printing and mailing and stamps and all that. So once again, I have this. We're going to run a little lottery, and I have this book that uh, Ben Juan Mandelbrot has uh, autographed and it's worth millions by then and it has special words in it. And if you turn in your uh, uh, deal, we do a little lottery and somebody will win this book. That would be wonderful. So even if you uh, have turned it in before, do it and give us an address and an email address and that would be most wonderful. I'd also like to thank then uh, one other uh, major component of why uh, a large portion of the audience is here is uh, due to Metagraphics Foundation. So there's Metagraphics Corporation, which is like a major co-sponsor. There's Metagraphics Foundation. They both contributed. The foundation in particular was the lead uh, for matching grant, a very large, wonderful matching grant that allows all the K-12 uh, teachers and everything. Are there anybody here on those tickets? <laughs> and, and, in, and in particular, uh, it, it's really uh, my pleasure now and this evening in particular to introduce someone you can give a, a very big thank you to who will introduce uh, Dr. Mandelbrot. It's Dr. Wally Rines, who's the chairman and CEO of Mentor Graphics Corporation. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I was on my way back to uh, Portland today on a plane and sat next to a man who uh, asked me uh, where I worked, and I told him uh, Mentor Graphics in Wilsonville. And he said, uh, Wilsonville, isn't that where they had uh, all the, neighbor the neighborhoods uh, opposed to locating the new state prison there? And I said, uh, well, yes, I believe there was some opposition. And he said, well, why were they so opposed? And I said, would you want all those CEOs living in your neighborhood? Okay, okay, <laughs> yes. Tonight we have a real pleasure. We have Dr. Benoit Mandelbrot, one of the truly great mathematicians of our time. He is the inventor of fractal geometry. He's had a very unconventional education and an unconventionally innovative career. I would tell you about his publications and presentations, but the list requires 47 pages. He was born in Warsaw, Poland, moved to France at the age of 12, was largely self-taught through high school because of the disruptions of World War II. He eventually studied at the Ecole Polytechnique and at Caltech, and has a PhD in mathematics from the University of Paris. He moved to the United States in 1958 and became 
an IBM fellow at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center. And he's also been a professor of the practice of mathematics at Harvard University, a professor of engineering at Yale, a professor of mathematics at École Polytechnique, a professor of economics at Harvard, and a professor of physiology at Einstein College of Medicine. He's currently the Sterling Professor of Mathematical Sciences at Yale, in addition to being an IBM Fellow Emeritus. At IBM, he delved into processes with unusual statistical properties and geometric features. That led to fractal geometry. It also required him to develop some of the first computer programs to print graphics. His famous 1967 article, How Long Is the Coast of Britain, provided a milestone in science and mathematics. The American scientist uh, called his 1977 monograph, called Fractals, as one of the top 100 scientific publications of the 20th century, and probably his most famous publication in 1982, The Fractal Geometry of Nature. He's had numerous honors, including the Barnard Medal, the Franklin Medal, the Humboldt Prize, the Steinmetz Medal, uh, one of the most significant, the Wolf Prize for Physics. Uh, one, some of you may appreciate the Moe Hennessy Prize for Science for Art. And this month, he'll receive the William Proctor Prize from Sigma Xi. Would you please join me tonight in welcoming Dr. Benoit Mandelbrot. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm always also surprised to hear of my life story because I find it each time equally incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and in a certain sense, my lecture is going to be perhaps somewhat autobiographical. Not that I'm going to speak of special events, but I'm going to go from field to field, not quite in a sequence in which I visited them, but in some rather complicated se sequence. Uh, the, the reasons that uh, led me to move like that as I did were very specific in each case. I had very good reasons to move, but for a long time, I must confess, I did not know where I was going. It's uh, surprising, but it's so. Now, my PhD, which was mentioned, was given by University of Paris uh, 50 years ago, almost to the day. In other words, I had uh, plenty of time to reflect upon what my PhD said and what was good or bad about it and what I was doing. And today I'm going to tell you, um, to describe to you my work the way I see it today, which is not the way I saw it before and perhaps not the way I shall see it tomorrow if there is a tomorrow. So uh, the talk will consist uh, almost exclusively in pictures and therefore let me uh, show you immediately some of them. The first one is simply the cover of the book in question, which was published in 82. Uh, and uh, the name of the book, the title of the book, has become quite obsolete. It speaks of nature, but uh, the book itself includes a, a chapter on stock market and other activities which certainly are not done by Mother Nature, but by man. Today, if I had to rewrite this book, I would call it the fractal geometry of nature and culture where culture is a kind of catch-all word which represents everything that uh, is around us but is not part of what nature has provided us with. Now, the big surprise is, of course, that in 20 years or so, I should be uh, contributing to the book I show you now. And uh, the, um, the big surprise is that this work, which began as a very laborious, uh, difficult, technical, um, frontier kind of work should have reached the stage it has today and which is witnessed by your presence here. Uh, it seems that I was fortunate in 
encountering, identifying, and playing with a chord of human sensibility, which uh, I do not suspect. In a way, the, my work has consisted in uniting, uniting all kinds of activities. It has a little bit of a flavor of uh, the famous stories of the beauty and the beast. The beauty it will be present uh, in some of the mathematics I will allude to. It will be present in some of the uh, science I will allude to, and the pictures, which have their own beauty and uh, which competes in some certain complicated fashion with the art. Now, uh, the beast, well, the beast, to begin with, is, present, is represented by this picture here. Now, it is one of the most uh, routine, uninteresting, unsophisticated um, pictures you can imagine. If you thought in terms of caste, which uh, unfortunately science is very much uh, affected by, this would not be of a caste of Brahmins interested in big abstract ideas, but a caste of street sweepers who sweep such ground to make it cleaner. Now, this uh, picture was taken by a geograph geologist friend of mine who um, uh, was w wanted to, to show something that geologists tell their students, at least some geologists tell their students. If you go out in the field and take pictures, always put in an element of scale. Because if you don't put a scale, you will not know what you have photographed. You will have some hill. Is it a small hill, a big hill, Himalayas? If you don't put an element of scale, you get mistaken. So this man was twice careful. He put his hand in the camera cap. How about this? Here is only camera cap. But wait a minute. Actually, it's not camera cap. The man was standing there. So the man on purpose made this big, big, big camera cap-like object <laughs> to, co to confuse you. And, and so, so how do you take such a phenomena? Uh, my friend told me that it was put in terms of how to say unhappy behavior, namely uh, not put elements of scale, and police action. Police action consisting in putting an element of scale to remember how big the thing is. Now, I turned the thing around and asked myself, but wait a minute. If it is true that the landscapes um, are the same at every distance, doesn't that say something about landscapes? No, if landscapes are completely flat, then they would certainly be the same at all, at all scales. You have a plane, you come closer and closer, same plane. A plane can be dilute, dilated and reduced without changing. But the, these landscapes are not planes. So the idea is that the landscapes embody some property which is common to the planes and to other shapes. That property has since become known as self-similarity which is a word that explains itself, but as it turns out, um, I coined it in 1964. It is a new word for an idea which was very old, but very old and never used. So the, um, we have to now to start worrying about rough surfaces. Now think about the um, history of humanity. Uh, make it grand. Why make it, why be modest for a moment? Um, uh, our information about the world comes from our senses, from the eye, the ear, the hand, the hand which weighs, the weightiness, hotness, and roughness, and other sensations. But we all know that uh, optics arose out of uh, visual signals, acoustics out of uh, auditory signals, um, thermodynamics out of hotness, mechanics out of heaviness. What about roughness? Amazingly enough, truly amazingly enough, roughness was not part of science as I was taught it. As a matter of fact, roughness, I don't think, was faced until fractal geometry. And you can say that if, you, if somebody asks you, what is fractal geometry? What is it amount to? The answer is, it is a study of roughness. It's the first study of roughness. It is very young. It has 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. It has accomplished a great deal but has not solved all the problems. There's plenty for everybody to do. So now let's look at two rough surfaces. Here is one, and here is another one. Now these two rough surfaces are completely artificial. They're total fakes. They're not photographs, not paintings. 
Many of you have seen them because um, my books have been around. Many of you have seen them without knowing in some ads on TV because techniques which uh, are introduced to, to mimic nature have become very useful in imitating landscapes in commercials. But how are we going to distinguish between these two, the roughness of these two shapes? It's a very, very important issue. Now, a science begins only with numbers. There is no science which is qualitative, at least no true hard science. Uh, of course, I'm acting very pedantically because biology has, does not begin with numbers, but with shapes. But let's speak of physics, mathematics, mechanics, astronomy. The first step is to have numbers. And numbers, a uh, number for, for, for light is frequency, number for hearing is again frequency, number for hotness, well, number of hotness is temperature. Temperature is much more recent than the frequency for sounds. It was invented by Galileo in a few centuries ago. But that was the beginning to have a number. How do you measure roughness? Incredible as it may sound, in fact, each time I say it, I find it more and more incredible. There was no measurement of roughness until uh, after my 82 book. In 84, I wrote a paper with a metallurgist to compare the roughness of different surfaces. So there's a number. And the existence of a number is very important. I'm going to uh, comment on it a little bit. But um, uh, let's come back to self-similarity uh, in some stronger sense. Here's a cauliflower. It's made of florets each of them a small cauliflower, and then florets have some sub-florets, etc., etc. If you look at cauliflower carefully with magnifying glass and very, very thin tweezers, you can decompose into pieces smaller and smaller, five times under. It's extraordinarily self-similar. The whole is a sum of pieces, each of which is like the whole, but smaller. It is the idea which the first pictures exemplified. Let's continue. Uh, here's this, a branch, the same thing. Now, who was aware of a tree being so similar? Not the scientists, because at least I didn't see any reference to self-similarity in, do in uh, old documents I read. But a French painter named Delacroix, who was a very brilliant intellectual and very good writer, did write to tell painters, if you paint a tree, think of a tree as being made of branches, which are like smaller trees. And this is a theme which, I, which I will, you will hear me repeat many times. The idea of self-similarity was new to science, and there was no word for it. But art knew it. And we shall here see examples of it now. Uh, here is another artificial tree made of branches, exactly reduced version of the whole. Um, but, so how do you um, uh, exemplify this similarity and how interesting it is, how young it is? On top, you see one of the, the objects most famous for being so similar. It's called Cantor set. Forget how it is produced. But the basic fact is that the whole of this set is made of two pieces, each of them smaller in the ratio of three. This was introduced in mathematics in 1880. But the bottom of the picture is a capital of a, a column in Egyptian temple of many million years ago. So they knew of this thing before we scientists knew of such similarity. Here is the Indian temple, and again, each part of it is like the whole, but smaller. Here is um, another construction, much more brutal, uh, which uh, similar in a way to Cantor set. You take a triangle, and you erase the middle third, divide the four, erase the middle part, and so on. So you see the whole set is made of three pieces, the yellow, the red, and the blue, I think, or green, and each of them reduced a version of the whole. Now, I call that the Sierpinski triangle, Sierpinski gasket, Sierpinski being a Polish mathematician who influenced my life. It's an in-joke. But the question is, is that a new idea? It is not a new idea. Um, uh, walking in Rome through the Sistine Chapel, I was struck by the fact that the pavement of the chapel has this design partly implemented, and some Italian churches have it implemented to rather high detail. 
So those people knew about the, 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 this kind of construction. And a few weeks ago, uh, walking through Ravenna, uh, we saw the pavement in which part was like that and part was just uh, square little tiles. So the decorators, the workmen who did decorate this incredibly beautiful church, uh, did have this as a possibility for design. So design could be either, how to say, squares or this kind of structure. No, uh, but something else is true. Look at this painting. It is a painting by Dali, The Face of Death. It is a remarkably scary painting, just like war is scary. And the most striking aspect is the way it is constructed. In the, the two eye sockets in the mouth, there is a reproduction of the whole structure, and again, and again, and again. After being struck by this picture, I became very conscious of uh, occurrences of this theme earlier and realized that Dali had long hesitated before um, drawing this, uh, painting this painting. He drew uh, preliminary cartoons, as they're called, uh, with drafts, and some of them were quite different from it. He gradually realized that self-similarity made this painting particularly scary and used it for the final painting. In other words, um, what I'm trying to, to, to emphasize is an extraordinary element of profound unity in human experience. The unity which, which, which consists in the purpose of science being to describe phenomena, even the kind of uninteresting, boring phenomena like uh, this first landscape, we must describe them. Science wants to describe the world and to explain it as much as it can. The second is the idea of mathematics, which extracts abstract shapes, abstract thoughts, etc., from our experience. And the third is art, which extracts also shapes and forms and patterns out of our experience for the purpose of pure visual enjoyment. And the two are linked in fashions which are uncannily deep. Now, here's another shape called the, the, the snowflake curve. It's made by taking a triangle, adding other triangles on top, etc., etc. Each time you add new triangles, the perimeter of this shape becomes longer. And so, if you look at the perimeter, in the limit, it's infinite. So, here's this curve, which has a finite, a simple shape, and has infinite perimeter, infinite length. What about that? Who ever heard of a curve with infinite length? When this thing was, was drawn early uh, late 19th century and early 20th, it was viewed as being a monster, pathological, as being something completely unrelated to, to, um, to either physics or, or science or human experience. But let's look at the next stage. This is an artificial landscape and an island, and the, the length of this coastline, as you look, measure it closer and closer, becomes longer and longer. That was the theme of this paper of 1967, uh, the, how long is the coast of Britain, that uh, the chairman of the meeting has mentioned before. A paper which showed that an idea that mathematicians had, which was purely a Brahmin idea, of removing oneself from experience as much as you can by making a curve of infinite length, which of course nature would not know, in fact, was not separate from our experience, was one with the experience we all had of the coastline being, becoming longer as you measure it closer and closer. So the, the, the clarity here is uh, that uh, these shapes, uh, Cantor set, the Shepinsky shape, and the snowflake curve were invented, at least that's what my teachers thought, invented for the purpose of liberating mathematics from the constraints of physics. They were arms created for this purpose. I, I turned around these arms. The same arms, I used them to reaffirm and confirm and deepen the immensely strong relationship between abstract shape and description of nature. The arms are the same, the purpose is exactly opposite. But wait a minute, what about this painting? Actually, it's a painting by a painter called Augusto Giacometti, the lesser-known cousin of Alberto Giacometti. 
And um, I put it sideways because it has the face of a woman and it's, it's sort of, I think, a picture called spring. The purpose of the, this painting was on, is uninteresting. What's interesting to me is decoration around it. And this, the, 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 the kind of construction of the snowflake curve, which is billows upon billows upon billows, that construction, Giacometti used it automatically, spontaneously in his work. Very familiar to him. And uh, he was one of the first abstract painters. Now, this is a very rapid step, a shape which was called um, a space-filling curve by a man named Piano who invented it in 1890. My teachers were saying that the, the space-filling curve is a purely abstract notion which had no relation to reality whatsoever. I showed them, I showed the world, I showed myself to begin with, that in fact this idea is implemented by the shores of a river and the affluence of the river, etc., etc. But let me, 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 me go on. I will just flash these pictures very rapidly because it's very late and I don't want you to read them. Uh, <laughs> but to tell you how, it, how a measurement is defined, it is not a mathematical lecture, but still, it's too late and it take 10 minutes to explain them. There is a very simple and natural way of measuring the roughness of shapes, and it's called fractal dimension. This way was invented in 1919 by a mathematician for the purposes of mathematical esoterica. No application whatsoever. Well, what I realized is that this number was in fact a measure of roughness. And I, I trained myself to establish a correspondence between this number and the roughness of obje objects which I am faced with. Now, think back to Galileo when he invented the thermometer. Before him, a good cook would know the temperature of a roast when it's ready to be, to be uh, eaten, uh, for smell, for, for by hand, by all kinds of different signs. But they had enormous amount of training for that. With a the thermometer, the result is much simpler, at least in the first approximation. But there had to be a correspondence between the two, because the thermometer would not correspond to our overall feeling of hotness or coldness, it would have been an inappropriate measurement. But dimension proved to be very appropriate, and so this is a preliminary version for, for this picture. It's a complicated picture to describe, but I would like to spend a few minutes on it. Imagine a city of Portland expanded to infinity, with again always streets crossing at right angles, forever and forever. And a drunk that walks through the streets, loses the key, and then goes forward, backward, to the left and the right at each corner, totally without any rhyme and reason. The word is at random. He's going to wander, and the black line you see going along the black curve is his trajectory. At long last, at the end of a million steps, miracle of miracles, he comes back where he started and finds his key. Now, this, uh, this drunkard's march has been known for a very, very long time. It is one of the great topics of late 19th and 20th century mathematics. There are dozens, hundreds of books about it. But one feature of my work has been that I never trust uh, the formula. Formulas are words. I always want to have a visual, close visual impression of what objects are, because I believe that a familiarity with how shapes look like it's fundamental in asking new questions. By looking at pictures, you cannot prove mathematical theorems. Never. You must have a logical written argument. But by looking at pictures, you can ask yourself new mathematical questions. And when this picture was prepared after laborious preliminary versions, it is photographed from my book of 82, my immediate reaction was that this picture was speaking to me not speaking, shouting at me. I am an island. I'm a very irregular island. Now, I had established before a very good relation, a very good feeling for how the dimension of different islands is, or different parts of the world. And so for this island, my conclusion was the boundary must be of dimension 4 divided by 3. Then you measured it, because you can measure fractal dimension. 
and it was 1.33336, close enough to four thirds, but certainly not exact. So the book, the writing you see here beginning there, the, the book um, advances the conjecture, dimensional Brown motion is equal to four thirds. Well, this idea gave rise for to 20 years of intensive work by many, many brilliant mathematicians. It proved to be extremely difficult to prove. It took 20 years, finally after 20 years, three men in different countries of different backgrounds got together and realized that by putting together 100 pages of one man's work, 100 pages of second man's work, and 100 pages of third man's work, a proof came out of it. It's one of the most complicated proofs of a time where proofs tend to become complicated. Triumph. And other results of the same kind came and were uh, more or less rapidly uh, proven. I wanted to mention that um, uh, to, uh, to emphasize the break that this, uh, this work represents from previous experience in mathematics. Early on, mathematics was very visual. We had little pebbles, counting little pebbles, and drawing circles and other shapes in the sand. But then mathematics became very abstract, and when I was a student, I was told very strongly that mathematics has completely broken its earlier relation with perceived shape. Well, it had not. What was missing, what was interpreted as a final break between mathematics and picture, was just the effect of a transient technology, because the hand and the pen were not adequate to give us anything new in mathematics. So we assumed that was the end. But the computer came, and I was fortunate to be able to uh, create very early on techniques to visualize phenomena which until then could not be visualized, and which nobody else wanted to visualize anyhow, but uh, to, to visualize them. And then out of that came this conjecture. The fourth third conjecture is a very fundamental uh, contribution to a big branch of mathematics. Now let's proceed. Uh, here is a picture of clouds, total fake. The, the, the realization of the idea that the cloud is not a sphere, but a sphere with billows upon billows upon billows. But here I don't add the billows by hand like a snowflake curve. There is a formula, very simple one, but a formula, which tells you how to construct this shape. Now, um, all my life as a young man, I was very struck by criticism of mathematics as being cold and dry. That geometry was cold and dry, and my friends who were in literature or in philosophy uh, or the arts were telling, you, telling me, your field is cold and dry, our field is warm, organic, alive. For example, geometry could never represent the shape of a cloud. A cloud is something that is so complicated, that changes so much, etc., etc., etc. Well, they were not right, they were wrong. <laughs> now, uh, let's continue. Here is a picture of turbulence. Clouds are a manifestation of uh, weather, which is part of turbulence theory. And uh, here is a very famous painting by the great Japanese painter Hokusai. Instead, the Hokusai is for me quite some kind of inspiration because I'm only 78. And Hokusai, when he was 94, wrote to a friend a letter in which he says, you know, now I think I begin to understand my trade. I've been painting, I've been painting for 80 years and now I know what I'm doing at long last. <laughs> so I have still many, some years to go before that. But Hokusai knew very well that turbulence, the waves, the spray, and so on, has elements of all scales. But of course, he didn't think that this could be, be a science. Here is a, a kind of tree we obtained in laboratory by breaking electric breakdown. Here is a model of that, which is called the DLA. And then again, looking at these previous pictures and introducing the techniques of fractal geometry, uh, two brilliant physicists who were able to produce a model of this kind of behavior, again called DLA, and this became an immense topic of study. It's an extremely difficult topic. Turbulence is also very difficult. 
Now, how is, do you measure difficulty in science? There are many ways. Uh, some people try to measure complexity, which is another way of saying difficulty. Uh, that is very difficult. It doesn't work out. But, but uh, one can measure difficulty by a kind of practical um, number, which is the time it takes to accomplish. If something, it takes, uh, if something is such that skilled people who get themselves applied to it do it in a few weeks, it's easy. If it takes years, it's difficult. If it takes centuries, it's more difficult still. And the turbulence has been around for quite a long time. Uh, every, every, every sailor knew about turbulence, about bad weather, about storms, and so on. But it is a very difficult subject. So did I say that I solved turbulence? I did not solve turbulence. But uh, fractal geometry has helped describe and understand and uh, deeply better understand turbulence. Do I say that I have understood this shape, the ELA? We don't. It's full of mysteries. But early on, when my friends were bemoaning the time it took to understand ELA, I was quite in the opposite, more or less positive, even triumphant mood. I said, well, here we have found a new, very difficult problem, which is going to occupy humanity for many generations, I'm sure. And to identify a new problem is a reason for rejoicing. Not a new problem which is inchoate, not expressible. A new problem expressed in a very concise and precise fashion. Now let me continue. Uh, here is another object which is called a um, percolation cluster. Again, uh, I could uh, spoke about it for a long time, but I would like simply to go on and show you this painting, which again by Giacometti, the same man. Uh, he, well, he lived in uh, eastern Switzerland, and during the winter, uh, he was painting paintings of what, how he remembered the meadows to be in the spring when flowers burst all over the place. Now, the purpose of this painting here is not to represent an, an actual field. He had not been looking at the field, he was not there in front of a, of a meadow, but to represent a, a harmony of colors. Now, the harmony of colors present in this painting is precisely uh, the same, or very close at least, to the harmony presented in the percolation cluster. And the depth of that is something very striking. Well, let me continue. Uh, I wanted to show you this masterpiece, which is uh, on the back cover of my book, Fractal Geometry of Nature, a composite by Richard Voss, one of the most, uh, the earliest and most amazing computer graphics uh, um, successes. But, uh, uh, and then a few more. Um, this one is by my student, uh, Ken Musgrave. Uh, this is also by Ken. Uh, this is also by Ken, as a matter of fact. Uh, and this too. The point is that by very simple algorithm you can do that. Now let's reflect a little bit about society because we must on every occasion. Imagine that uh, when I had the idea of this uh, construction, which was around the late 60s, uh, immediately after the paper on how long it cost of Britain, imagine that I would have been in a position to ask the uh, National Science Foundation to fund me for the purpose of seeking a formula for mountains. Now, Nobody would believe for a minute that the NSF had funded me at all. This had been sent back instantly as being inappropriate. There was no agency to that, and besides, the idea is totally foolish and ridiculous. So uh, this was done, um, well, on the side as part of the work until it became well known and appropriate to discuss. Now, let's move to, from that to prices. Well, these are four price series, uh, but let's uh, look at this one because it's very difficult to t make sense out of uh, zigzags we find in the financial pages. It's better to look at the differences. And the line on top, very, very top, which goes up and down a little, is the, um, the theory which business schools have the cheek of teaching the students about variation of prices. And that theory, in terms of physics, is an exactly Brown motion, what I told about Drunkard. But more precisely, it is a process in which nothing much happens. It's a process which is calm and so on, like the kind of weather for which, if you want to go fish, you don't need to take a big solid boat, you just take a flat bottom and go on the lake and fish, because temperatures will go up and down, up and down a little bit, but never very much. Now, the lines in the bottom uh, are a mixture 
of uh, the actual price series on the one hand and a uh, price series uh, cooked up by my model. I will not explain my model. It takes only a few lines, but a few lines of hard algebra. But uh, it's very difficult to turn apart. And the main fact is that uh, the weather uh, and the stock market are very, very similar. That is what, uh, um, what Mellon or Carnegie was supposed to have said, uh, that both are unpredictable. Well, they're both very rough. And uh, the weather uh, gives us uh, opportunities of uh, storms. And the storminess is different in different parts of the world. Therefore, there is not one model of the weather. There is not the weather as a universal process. There is the weather in some balmy island in in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, when there are no hurricanes worth talking about, then the weather in other parts of the Mediterranean or on the east or west coast of the US, when there are big hurricanes, or the weather in, in Asia with the typhoons. Now, you, you live differently in these different parts. So if you want to navigate, for, if you want a ship that will survive for 30 years in typhoon prone region, you better build it strong. Otherwise, it won't come back with drastic consequences. So the characteristic of prices is that uh, this presence of very large deviations. Um, well, um, here I just, uh, again, won't stick on that because I have no time. There is a way of uh, mimicking uh, price behavior, and it has one tunable number. On top, you get the very peaceful lake. You go fishing in a flat bottom thing. And then as you go down, worse and worse weather or worse and worse, more and more erratic and volatile prices. Well, I go, go on, I have no time for it, but I would like to emphasize this topic, because, again, to emphasize this matter of the fractal geometry of nature and culture. The stock market is not part of nature, it's man-made. Turbulence is nature. Why is it possible for two of them to have the same theory? Without, uh, how to say, other knowledge, if somebody tells you that he, he sells um, an ointment which, um, if you put in your head, heals your headache, if you put on your, uh, on your elbow, uh, eases muscular pain, and on your foot eases your something, well, you say he's just selling snake oil. Well, so uh, I, I might have been called a snake oil or a salesman, even though I may not have the proper manners, but um, the, the fact is that I don't claim that turbulence and the weather and the stock market are the same. I claim that both are very rough phenomena. And if you have rough phenomena, you don't approach them by techniques appropriate for smooth phenomena. You must have special tools, and those tools are called fractal geometry. And one, the first step is the same. Similarly, like in, in thermodynamics, the first step is to define temperature for a gas or for a solid or for anything else. The same notion applies to all. Then, if you study gas and a solid, they have very different theories indeed. They are different states of matter. So, the first step is more universal. And the first step must be simple. Because in science, there's a general rule that if a first approximation theory is full of bells and whistles, it may fly a little bit, but won't fly very far. The good theories that work out begin by being extremely simple, but not oversimplified. And then, as you go on, you add bells and whistles. This one is a good theory because it gives much resemblance to reality without bells and whistles. Now, I would like to go to the last part of this talk, which is the Mandelbrot set and things related to it. I used to speak for the full hour about this topic, but uh, there are so many pictures of Mandelbrot set everywhere that, uh, in a certain sense, I'm no, no longer there. I'm told that the number of Mandelbrot set sites on the web is, I forgot how many, 127,573, you know, ridiculously high numbers. So everybody can find their own, and um, the ours uh, are not necessarily uh, the most brilliant or the most elaborate. They were the first, but not necessarily the most elaborate. But um, uh, this uh, is a shape which uh, um, 
uh, it's called the Julia set. More precisely, the, the color parts are called the fatus domains and the boundaries called Julia set. Julia was a teacher of mine uh, in the early 40s, the middle 40s rather. And at one point, uh, I was um, advised by uh, my uncle, who was a very important person in my life, uh, to write a PhD on that theory on the basis that uh, it had been done in 1917 by Julia, and for 30 years, nothing much had happened. So he, my uncle told me, try to move it further. You'll get great amount of uh, response for it, and good job, etc., etc. I tried my best and found nothing. Well, because it is, again the same thing happened. Julia and I, in 1947, were trying to do it all by pure thought which was the only way anybody knew of doing mathematics. But in this case, pure thought was not enough, because 30 more years went on without any change in the fact that Julia theory was more or less in the state where it started in 1917. But again, 30 years later, uh, in late 70s, uh, I introduced a new tool. The new tool was not new idea in mathematics, but was the eye the picture. And this picture is one of the first pictures of Julia Set ever done. Julia wrote a very big, very complicated, very learned uh, paper, which made him famous, without ever seeing the object he was describing. The fact he went as far as he did is marvelous, which shows mathematics to be a very powerful way of doing things. But it is powerful up to a point, and then was stuck. Pictures unstuck it because seeing what Julia was writing about, I could go beyond Julia, which I could not do before. Now, I would like to show you a few pictures of Julia's sets. Oh, here's the formula which is used, it's a very, very simple one. Um, a few pictures just actually they are of Julia's sets before dimensions, but forget about it. The, the point is that these shapes are not works of art in the ordinary sense, they don't represent the style of any period, as a matter of fact, by changing a number, you change the picture and you seem to change the style. The uh, control of, of wealth of uh, design beyond belief, and if you want to discuss that matter, I'd be happy to talk about it later. Uh, and, and this and this uh, piece of jewelry, which was not designed by a great jeweler, but by Mother Nature or whoever did, does mathematics, is part of pure mathematics as visualized. It's a wonderful work of art. Then uh, there's another thing. You see this little man in the bottom fighting against the, the kind of ropes around his body? Well, it is not a caricature. It is, again, pure mathematics. Um, that's Mandelbrot set, as everybody seems to know at this point. And these are a few pieces of it. I will not dwell on that again. They're a bit different from those you see on the web. but. Uh, and this one, this one is my dude. So here, the Mandelbrot set is, is actually a wonderful shape because you, it embodies an idea which music took a very long time to develop, the idea of theme and variation. As you look deeper and deeper in Mandelbrot set, you get little Mandelbrot sets um, all over the place. Uh, discovering them was <laughs> a key, key point of my life, as a matter of fact. Um, but in addition, the, what's around these, uh, these key, the little reproductions varies from point to point, never the same. So these are the theme, and everything else is the variations. Now, this is a particularly big Mandelbrot set, <laughs> which was cut uh, on a field of wheat uh, close to Cambridge, UK, at a time where uh, some pranksters were uh, cutting uh, uh, corn circles. Corn in Queen's English means wheat. Uh, so uh, they were doing circles, they got bored making circles, they demanded about set. Uh, a pilot was flying by, took this picture, took it to the local newspaper, they published it on page one the next day saying the Martians have landed. <laughs> actually, actually, uh, next day, uh, they had the, the 6,000 letters received by journal expl explained to them what it was. It just happened that a few weeks before I was a, 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 a Roundsball lecturer at Cambridge, so everybody in Cambridge knew that. Now, of course, everybody knows it. It's a very, very hasty production. I could criticize it forever, but why bother? <laughs> 
Well, the Mandelbrot set is the most complex object in nature. Um, I don't know what exactly what it means, but I can tell you one aspect of it. Why they study Mandelbrot set? Uh, after the initial excitement that this new, of this new idea, people say, but wait a minute, why the hell did you take this? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> why do you take this very silly formula and define this set? What was the point? What led you to that? Well, actually, I was not at all interested in this set. I was interested in another set. Call it N, for the sake of argument. But N was very difficult to draw. In fact, uh, impossible with the means I had at my disposal at that time. Computers were not fast enough, and it was tedious, and it was uh, very bad pictures, and so on. So I thought that perhaps uh, M would help me understand the N. I drew M and then made tests which made me believe that M is equal to N plus all the points on the boundary of N. Well, it's again the, the conjecture takes uh, two lines. It's M equal closure of N. Now, that was my idea in 1978, 9, 80 on this thing. That idea is still unproven. For 20 years, a large community of mathematicians did nothing but try to prove it. Well, did the other things in the meantime, but the goal was to prove it. They have failed. And on the basis of what I told you about difficult mathematics, this is very difficult mathematics because so many people, so brilliant, took so long to study it and did not succeed yet. So um, everybody knows about um, Fermat conjecture, so-called theorem, which took 350 years to prove to great acclaim by Mr. Wiley. And, but the belief has spread uh, certainly among the common folk, to call them uh, by their common nice name, that mathematics uh, sort of stopped uh, at the time of the most difficult thing they learned in school. So since the most people failed at to understand integration, integration was Newton, so probably mathematics had died with Newton. Uh, when mathematicians uh, strenuously object and say mathematics is widely alive, there are so many people doing that with great joy and uh, great uh, success, it is very difficult to transmit that idea to, to people because the mathematics, uh, the bulk of mathematics, uh, has very few new things that you could explain to an ordinary person. As a matter of fact, has very few things you can explain to me. Because I'm not in those fields. They're very, very specialized. So some identity in algebra, which is viewed as being very, very difficult, I don't even understand what it means. Whereas the conjectures I showed you, this one, which is open, the four thirds, and some other, which I could quote if I had time, can be explained to Yale undergraduates without any difficulty, and I don't mean Yale math undergraduates, I mean Yale undergraduates in English lit, divinity, music, architecture, and so on. And the book which I flashed the cover of is related to the course we give Mr. Frame and I, mostly Mr. Frame now, uh, to those students. Now, the, so the, the uh, well, let me show you a few more of these pictures and then wind up. This is a different uh, formula, but uh, you can look at closer and closer, and, and here you get this. Uh, oh, my God. There's a principle in every slideshow, one slide is turned upside down or otherwise. So let me, <laughs> let me forget about this one and move to the next. And, and this one, this one, I forgot the formula because my assistant made a mistake in, the prog in programming. I made sure that he made a copy of the mistaken picture, but he didn't keep the program. So <laughs> it makes it even better. This one is even better. Well, to conclude, Galileo wrote this marvelous statement of role of mathematics, that mathematics is written in a great book which is called The Universe, and that the characters are circles, triangles, and lines without which one earth in dark labyrinths. Well, Galileo was writing about volume one, of the great book of nature. Volume one, devoted to smooth shapes. There is volume two, devoted to rough shapes. And there is a book called The Great Book of Culture, which is devoted to man's creations, which is equally important. And for volume two and for volume three, you need fractals as basic shapes. And to end, let me quote from 
Goethe's Faust, a statement uh, which must be, must be explained. Uh, in that story, Faust, the professor at the university, uh, Mephistopheles, of course, the devil, uh, Faust, uh, the talk, Faust uh, has to excuse himself and leaves his robes. The devil puts the robes of the doctor on himself. A student walks by and asks the devil, whom he thinks actually is Dr. Faust, which courses the university could provide with him with. And um, the devil tells him about mathematics, about theology, and they're all very dry. The student is very unsmiling. It doesn't look like something he wants to study. And then other topics which are very warm, much warmer, and that is statement of the devil. Well, the devil, of course, uh, everybody wants the devil to be wrong. And this devil was wrong, at least on this account. Because you can be at the same time very strictly theoretical, mathematical, and be of great beauty, organic complexity, etc., etc., and that is proven by the existence of fractals and now of fractal geometry. Thank you. This is somewhat long, but I'll read this. So there's, it says, besides the Cantor set and the snowflake curve, what other self-similar objects were known in the 19th century? And how much of uh, mathematics, how much of the mathematics needed for fractal geometry and chaos would have been accessible to 19th century mathematicians? Very few. Uh, the Cantor set, uh, the, pian the piano curve, the Chepinski uh, square, uh, which is in addition to the triangle, which I did not show, and a few others. Uh, the list uh, it was not long because no long list was necessary. Actually, these objects were not an object of interest. They were um, only made a point that certain ideas which uh, man held dear were wrong. Uh, Poincaré, who lived at that time, uh, made the following comment, which is worth repeating. He said, in the past, when somebody invented a new shape, it was to help understand nature, but today people invent new shapes just for the purpose of annoying me. <laughs> and a few shapes are enough. Uh, so the reason why they were self-similar was not because of any deep thought. It is just easier to write down. You take for counter set, you divide into two, etc., etc. Or it's very easy to say, and I say, repeat, repeat, repeat. Now, for a long time, it was just a matter of saving paper and ink, um, but uh, as anybody who knows computer would realize, um, it is marvelous for the computer. The computer loves to be told to do so that again, 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 a million times. So self-similarity was simply a convenience um, uh, for one viewpoint. It turned out to be um, an essential aspect for others. When I, the first good pictures of those basic 19th century shapes were drawn by me. Because previously, nobody, nobody thought they were important. So they're not pictures, they're diagrams to explain how they're constructed. And for example, my discovery concerning piano curve, that is nothing but the shores of a network of rivers, was because I, was, I believed in the power of the eye, and I drew a piano curve in great detail, and the piano curve not the first one, but the fifth or the sec sixth I looked at, uh, told me, spoke to me, screamed at me, I'm a river network. Pictures have an, um, a, a power of uh, suggesting uh, new interpretations, which is beyond belief. Uh, this, uh, okay, so I know that the power law has recently been found to directly relate uh, to the size of forest fires and their frequency but how do fractals allow scientists to estimate when fires will occur in given places, when and where? Power laws are a very interesting story. My first paper was on power laws. That was 1951. At that time, power laws were the, a very deeply despised topic. Nobody felt that 
what I was doing had any interest. Today is a very big thing, uh, which I'm very pleased by, and which I worked uh, very hard for 50 years. Um, so power laws rule distribution of forest fires among millions of the phenomena. And uh, they don't help prediction a bit. But the question is to be sort of realistic. Uh, do you want to have full prediction? Do you hope for full prediction? Or do you hope for enough knowledge to help your life become better? Now, nobody any longer wants to predict the path of a, of a hurricane along the east coast of the US. It's not a matter of power laws, not a matter of fractals, a matter of weather prediction. It is impossible. Nobody um, who is honest uh, is going to predict you the exact time when the next big um, crash will occur in the stock market because nobody can do it. However, the, the matter of, of, um, of uh, hurricanes, it's important to know how big the hurricanes are, how often they occur, because if you want to trade long distance, you better know. If you, if you listen to plays of the 17th, 18th century, a very common theme was that of uh, some ship owner who had his whole fortune in a ship going to China, the ship going to South to the Indies, and uh, the, both ships sink and the person is ruined. And they sink because they were not built strong enough to, to withstand the weather they were meant to withstand. So the, um, the, the uh, more realistic hope is not to predict the exact time or strength of, um, of uh, uh, weather or of an um, earthquake, but to build houses to resist earthquakes up to a point which uh, society believes is, um, is necessary and it can afford. So um, the same thing applies uh, in many other contexts. Prediction is a very nice ideal, but uh, the main feature of science um, is the following one, which was taught to me by the person with whom I did my postdoctorate um, year, uh, John von Neumann. He said that a scientist must be opportunist, that there's no virtue whatsoever, no virtue whatsoever in having high aims you cannot accomplish. So if you tell me my aim is to predict prices, to predict the weather, to predict earthquakes, I say good luck. Uh, get me a job? No. I mean, aims are not enough. If your aims are too easy, well, nobody pay attention because everybody can do it. So the art of, um, of science it consists in identifying questions which are at the same time uh, too difficult for everybody to do spontaneously, and, but still doable. And the prediction in most of these cases is a totally absurd and a meaningless goal, which I, I don't lose any sleep on. But the matter of predicting the intensity of, of these things is a very important field, and I'm very much concerned with it. Okay, is there anybody at the microphones? Yeah, go ahead over here. Then. I have a simple question, uh, which might help others not so familiar with your work. Um, uh, how do these things get started, these patterns? There's a, there's a relationship that once you get into into this pattern, it, it goes in and it changes and evolves, but is there a seed that gets it started, similar to an initial condition that starts the law of induction to go from n to n plus one? How do you get them started? Can you apply a pattern to different seeds? Can you speak to that? Well, you mean the mountains? Well, the mountains have a certain formula. The, the, the formula embodies very loosely the notion of a, a mountain being made of pyramids piled upon each other with pyramids of each size having the proper numbers. And the pyramids, of course, are just approximations, but that's what it embodies as idea. And um, a seed is typed in, uh, and um, in good computer uh, software, the, um, the seed is known, can be, can be recorded, and it gives you a, one mountain. You change the seed, an entirely different mountain comes up. Now, early on, with the mountains I showed you early on, due to Richard Voss, uh, we didn't like these mountains particularly, and uh, Richard or somebody else wanted to have uh, to run the thing with different seeds uh, to make it better. And I said, don't, because everybody is going to accuse us of selecting the nice one, that we got many failures and selected the, the one which looks right. So in order to answer this criticism which is bound to come, Let's keep the first seed. 
I must add a criticism of the, of the software um, uh, community. And my assistants tell me that today it is impossible to put a seed you want uh, because the machine itself decides upon a seed, which is a ridiculous idea, which makes my work impossible. So they have to put patches to read the seed the machine is going to be using for a simulation, which is criminal. But I don't know how it got to be this way, but that's apparently how it is. Uh, but um, for these pictures, which are done in a less, uh, a simpler time, we put one number, which was dimension, the roughness, desired roughness, and a second number, which was the seed, and then um, additional numbers, of course, for condition of lighting. The lighting is something which is separate from the relief itself. I have. Yes. Um, thank you for coming, Dr. Manabrat. Um, I um, had a question like the artwork of E.C. Escher or the geometry of uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, was your life completely changed when you discovered the Manabrat set and this is what you pursued, or was this your uh, postdoctorate work? Oh, well, uh, I was uh, well in my 50s when I discovered Manabrat set. Um, there is a very uh, widespread uh, notion that uh, mathematics is a young man's game and that uh, people who had not done notable work in mathematics uh, by 30 would never do so. Um, uh, this uh, theory is based on five examples, <laughs> or six examples, very conspicuous ones. Uh, so Galois and Abel did their best work before 30 because by 30 they were both dead. And it turns out that Einstein was 25 when he wrote those marvelous papers and that the creators of um, quantum mechanics included um, Pauli, who was 19, and uh, Heisenberg was 23, and Dirac was 25. But they also included Schrodinger, who was well in his 30s, and, and De Broglie, who was well in his 30s. So even there, the idea that um, great work is done early on it was the result of careful selection. Um, um, there is many, many examples of uh, people doing excellent work in mathematics or theoretical physics very late in life. Now, in my particular case, uh, my path was so tortuous, so fractal, some people say, that uh, I didn't get to, to those topics until very late in life. And then I discovered that rather rapidly. Um, it was a turning point in my life. In many ways, yes, uh, but more because of the, what came after than because of um, what came before. Uh, in the case of iteration, uh, my discovery was made in a very public fashion. I was then a visiting professor of mathematics at Harvard. Uh, early on, when I came to Harvard, I, I introduced myself to my new colleagues uh, and showed them my book of 77. Uh, I would say two or three were very much in favor because they invited me, they wanted me to come. Uh, the others looked at the pictures and said, well, they're nice pictures, but they're pictures. That's not, not mathematics. Uh, in fact, they were quite, uh, quite uh, cold uh, to my project. But during the year, uh, I, uh, I started working on that and was going to the cubby holes to get my mail with always having also a batch of uh, outputs. And everybody started uh, coming around me and saying, what is the last picture? Show me us the last picture. And what do we see in that picture? I see nothing. So I will explain to them what I saw in that picture. As a result of that and of a few lectures I gave in 1980, the study of that topic started very rapidly. But in my life, it was probably the only example of something starting so rapidly. Other topics, my work on prices was done to about one half in the 60s. It got a very good reception uh, early on, then was uh, put under a very thick rug, uh, and um, it crawled out of the rug uh, in the mid-90s, uh, and now it's very active, in fact, extremely active. Um, so there was no time for a kind of exaltation of, of being so happy in doing something everybody likes and approves of. And other works of mine took very, very long before anybody paid attention. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't say I don't mind, but I can bear it. <laughs> uh, and I certainly didn't suffer from it particularly. Uh, but so the, um, the work of Mandelbrot set was unique in that, again, everybody started working on it immediately. Even the four-thirds 
took uh, several years before people uh, realized how difficult it was. Um, when my book of 82 came out uh, with this fourth third hypothesis, uh, all my friends said, well, it's a pity the book is already out because had you told me of that hypothesis, I could have proven it for you. Um, uh, but uh, now it's too late. Another fellow said he would take a week to do it, another said a month, another said a year, and finally it took not only a century but a millennium, <laughs> if you count 2000 as being the current millennium. So you can see it took a very long time. So um, it was, um, uh, this was a very progressive increase of, uh, of um, passion uh, from something which was not very exciting, amusing, but perhaps uh, insignificant to the realization that uh, this fourth third hypothesis was um, a, a seed from which enormous amount of very, very important work was going to come out. Thank you. Dr. Marilov, I have one more question. Yes. Um, hello. Thank you for coming and thank you for your brilliant mind. I'd like to get your take on the following quote. Culturally, fractal principles show that one strong will can influence social change by clear action, however small. I think it's right. <laughs> who, who wrote that? Who wrote that? Did you write that? <laughs> let, me, uh, let me read a couple more of these. In. Uh, there's, I'm uh, trying to put them together here. Can I ask a question in the middle? No, I've got it. I'm on it now. So it's actually a, uh, I'm going to semi-interpret one of these. Because they're actually, uh, they're asking, it says, in quantum theory, ideas of smoothness break down. Uh, do you see applications of fractal geometry in that realm? And I'm wondering, Ian Stewart kind of made a pitch in that direction with his book, Does God Play Dice? Yeah? Well, uh, it's a very tempting uh, question, and many people have worked on it. So far, it's sort of piecemeal contacts. I think that in the future, they will cease to be piecemeal. But uh, Hawking and uh, Wheeler uh, both uh, think that at extremely small scales, uh, time and space merge in what they call space-time foam. And um, they describe space-time foam in a very awkward and clumsy fashion, uh, but uh, then realize that uh, it was fractal and both Hawking and Wheeler are very excited by this idea. Uh, it has not become widely um, accepted, but that doesn't mean it's not true, not useful. Uh, and um, many other parts of quantum mechanics uh, um, can be expressed elegantly in fractal language. Um, at this point, it's mostly a matter of restatement um, and uh, helping understanding. Um, a real uh, get-together is yet to come. We, uh, there were several questions. Uh, people saw that the relationship of the colors, when colors are added, and what are these, the colors in the uh, various fractal art? Well, uh, the, um, the colors play a very different role in the mountains and the Mandelbrot set pictures. In the mountains, initially, uh, we decided to use the colors of the London Times Atlas to indicate height. But it was, this gave rather ridiculous uh, um, shapes like. Um, you know, the way you cut hair for some young kids by putting a ball on your head and cutting everything which sticks out. So uh, later, later uh, Voss uh, introduced an algorithm which depends upon altitude and also average slope. Uh, and the pictures you saw were on this basis. But since everybody was going to tell us um, that uh, perhaps uh, the pictures, the colors uh, provide the feeling of relief uh, in my fuller uh, uh, lecture and also my book, I provide some pictures of these mountains without any color whatsoever. So you have uh, the mountains under the snow and they still look like mountains. <laughs> so the colors are, are just uh, sugar on a pill which is not bitter anyhow. Uh, in the case of the Mandelbrot set, it's something else. The, the different colors, uh, each color defines an area in which a notion which is fundamental in, in, in science, uh, called potential, uh, has a certain value. And it's actually very easy to measure because it's a time of escape in the construction of those sets. 
so for uh, the, the, the colors indicate how long it takes a point to escape to infinity, which means escape beyond a big circle. Uh, the colors are totally arbitrary, uh, but they must be different. They're being, they're being different is the essential thing. And that is actually where a big distinction occurs between good taste and bad taste, and uh, in which the intervention of the programmer or the artist um, is so important in terms of, um, of uh, this work, because this work does not express, uh, how to say, the ag agonies of an artist which art is, uh, claims to represent. Um, it represents uh, something very objective and very cold in principle, but the fact uh, as proven by those 175,000, I don't know which number, this very large number of websites, most of them are just washed out and don't tell you anything or too violently colored and aggress the eye instead of pleasing the eye, and many are very beautiful. So um, the, uh, to make uh, fractals, a man who got set into an art, um, does require the hand of somebody who has good taste and understanding of proper design. But um, uh, these things were redone um, in also in zebra stripes, in which colors are avoided. So alternatingly, the colors are black and white, and the result is zebra stripes. Uh, zebra stripes are extremely uh, important um, in research. I have uh, drawn uh, large numbers of them. They are not so striking to show uh, in these circumstances, so I don't show them so much. Um, it turns out actually that um, the DLA, which I mentioned as being another um, big bear which uh, will take many years to solve, uh, also is drawn with colors, which also correspond to the Appalachian potential. Uh, that is the only resemblance between the two, more precisely the two resemblances, the fact that the shape of the Appalachian equipotential is important. The second fact is both are devilishly difficult. I'm going to do one more and then we'll go around. Um, I think I'm going to kind of change the, uh, I think when uh, fractals and chaos theory have been developing over the years, there was a number of people who uh, suggested that there is a common human experience and observation that you uh, happen to go to a foreign city and you, uh, and, you, and you walking down the street and there's your neighbor. These are like coincidental things, things that seem very coincidental and whether or not the uh, chaotic view of uh, human affairs interaction would be uh, an observation. I don't, mean, I don't meet my neighbors. You bailed on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no comment. <laughs> okay. okay, let's go around. So, is there someone over here? Thank you for taking my question. I, have, I saw some uh, very complex and beautiful pictures made out of um, repeated usage um, of very simple forms such as triangles and squares and uh, circles uh, and, and a complex picture being uh, built from uh, ground up using the same form again and again. Now that seems like taking a simple and going to a complex. I'm wondering um, if that work has been done where uh, a actual natural picture, be it a complex leaf or a complex uh, set of clouds taken as a basis and then deduce from that a very simple uh, formula that with maybe triangles or circles or squares uh, and coming to that conclusion in a reverse fashion. Well, it's a, it's a famous inverse problem. Um, in, in reality, it is posed in every field and it can't be done. For example, geology uh, doesn't tell you um, uh, anything about specific mountains, Mount Whitney, Mount Hood, Mont Blanc, they are individual mountains. Geology tells about generic mountain. Uh, the desire to have the inverse problem solved is particularly acute in the case of prices. So I give this uh, toy, toy mechanism to get a reasonable looking price series, which I went very rapidly. I flashed it and without any comment, I got thousands of letters of people in the stock market saying how I'm going to extract this structure from, from the real prices. You cannot. I mean, this structure is purely a cartoon. Um, and so, again, it is true that, um, that uh, uh, say, the, the counter set or the Schepisi triangle obtained by repeating a certain simple pattern in a certain fashion forever. So it's complexity which is uh, limited because it is made of simple shapes. 
but the clouds do not have, and the and landscapes I showed you do not have any little cubes or cones embedded in them. They are built as they are. Then the parts, the pieces are quite imaginary. This actually has an interesting uh, consequence from the viewpoint of art. Uh, it was a period of cubism, and Cezanne claimed that everything in nature was made of cubes, and other people went much further than Cezanne. Um, well, I don't think it's made of cubes. <laughs> so they had a view of complexity, which was uh, being less complex than I think it is. Now you tell me uh, I'm, being, I'm being unnecessarily timid, and um, why don't I tackle complexity in its full bloom? And my answer is, I can't. In fact, nobody can. So, um, uh, uh, as von Neumann said, one sh is not rewarded for uh, having very ambitious goals uh, at all. And von Neumann said, it is right that one should, should not be rewarded for ambitious goals. Um, one must uh, understand that to go from smooth to rough, it is not something you do in one big theoretical swoop. And uh, to be more specific, um, in science there have been a kind of interplay of two kinds of theories, the top to the bottom and the bottom up. Um, mathematics, once it is um, well developed, becomes a top top-down theory, you put some principles and develop the principles. Relativity theory is also a top-down theory, has been for a long time. You put general principles, you follow the consequences. The fractals were just the opposite. It was bottom-up theory, and um, uh, I go as far as I can. If uh, I live 25 years more, which I don't think I will, I may go a few steps more. But uh, other people will go, go more. But to ambition to go immediately from to extreme complexity, I think, is unwise. Yes, good evening. Uh, my question is about the nature of mathematics. Do you believe that mathematics is something that exists intrinsically in the fabric of the universe, or is it something that man created to explain the surroundings? Well, I believe that doesn't matter. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, the, uh, I know people who believe one or the other, and they argue endlessly, but the, 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 the mathematics they do is the same. And the, um, I certainly, when I discovered Mandelbrot set, I didn't think that he invented it. I was the first to see it, yes, but uh, I didn't invent it, it was there. But where? I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, uh, truly. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm surprised by the passion that some of my friends uh, put in this discussion. Uh, uh, I think that um, the discussion was primarily uh, started in, in Plato, where Plato wants to distinguish between mathematics, which is a pure thought, and any reality, which is um, sort of dirty. And Plato was very much a Brahmin uh, in the Greek sense. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, he, he threw out of his school uh, people who spoke of physics too much because he felt that physics was dirty and unworthy of the uh, human mind. Uh, I, I know more and more about Plato, and my um, admiration for his mind increases, and my hatred for his ideas also increases. <laughs> so, uh, I, think, I think Plato was not a mathematician, never practiced mathematics. He, he was an ideologue. Uh, he, he, Platonism had a very bad influence over the way mathematics is practiced. Um, uh, when I was a student, um, some kind of Platonism was all the, all the rage in Paris, um, and uh, it was called Dubaki. It was a reigning school. Um, I think I was the only person who resisted them and survived to tell the story. Uh, but um, it, it is just a priori. One, one should not make that matter particularly. It, it is not good for, for the progress of mathematics, I think. Good evening, Dr. Mandelbrot. Thank you for coming. I'm here with a group of middle school and high school students currently studying geometry. And my questions for you are, could you please describe um, the nature of chaos theory and the relationship between chaos theory and fractal geometry? Well, it's a big question, but it's a very important one. So. 
Uh, fractal geometry is a geometry. It's concerned with shapes. Uh, it is concerned also with mathematics, which uh, serves to explain those shapes. But uh, in general, I hate to apply it too broadly. So um, it's the shapes you saw and many, many more, <laughs> just endless numbers of a very big family with many complicated kinship relations. Um, chaos theory was um, primarily uh, concerned with motion of an object. So there's an object, for example, a pendulum, um, and you know this an object itself, which is rather boring, but in the way it evolves in time. Now, if you represent a chaotic behavior uh, geometrically, the representations are invariably fractal. So chaos theory C is in my right hand, fractal is my left hand, and there's a big common part. But there's also a part of each theory which is, does not belong to the common part, because chaos theory includes a great deal of considerations which are not geometric at all, therefore not fractal. And fractal geometry includes an enormous number of considerations which are concerned randomness and not chaos. Random and chaos are related, but very distantly. So the fractal mountains are in the part of fractal geometry which is not chaos theory. The Mandelbrot set is the part of um, fractal geometry which is chaos theory and which is one of the simplest and most visual and most um, difficult and most attractive uh, parts of chaos theory. Um, uh, these are the only, ones, only parts of chaos theory that I studied myself uh, at any depth but uh, colleagues of mine study other aspects of chaos theory which have almost no visual as uh, aspect and uh, which um, I uh, don't have uh, a strong personal interest in. But one should be uh, very, very careful about one thing which uh, is a bit, a bit bizarre. The mathematics is the most precise um, uh, triumph of human mind. Bar none, I mean, almost everything else is very loose and um, argumentative compared to mathematics. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the um, concepts of mathematics or the areas of mathematics are well defined. Um, many people ask me, how do you define fractal geometry? My answer is very simple, I won't. But how can you? How can you study fractal geometry without defining it? I say, what's your field? My field is probability theory, the man says. All right, define probability theory. Well, probability theory is that part of measure theory which, 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 well, you know, it's, uh, it's a part of measure theory. Which part? Well, it's a part of measure theory I'm interested in. Now, the, if you took, take topology, uh, the words don't need to mean anything to you, but there's something called um, point set topology. How do you define point set, point set topology? Uh, Bubaki, who is my, the people I fought uh, against uh, 50 years ago, uh, and survived, I'm pleased to say, uh, uh, Bubaki defined the uh, uh, points of topology as a study of notion of neighborhood. Well, that's not the definition. It's a kind of impressionistic thing. So, the, where does chaos theory begin or end? I don't know. Where does fractal geometry begin and end? I don't know. And it is not useful to worry about that. <clears throat> These may be the maybe the maybe the last three. So um, this is talking about large scale structures, galaxies, so forth. So I wanted to throw in a little editorial on this, which you've probably heard from me before. But Stephen Hawking was here last March, and he was talking about he was talking about the evolution of from the Big Bang, and one of the big questions for the classical science is where does all the differences come about in the universe? You have this bang, this point, and it expands. Why doesn't it just expand homogeneously? And they talk about maybe some quantum fluctuations down there and so forth. But I go like, wait a minute. Maybe the Big Bang has a fractal face as well. Not, it's not totally fractal, but it has a fractal face. It seems obvious. It's just not structure of galaxies. Is not somebody made some data on that already? Well, uh, the structure of galaxies is a very uh, broad word. Distribution. The, the first thing is distribution of galaxies. So in my book, I, I put forward the, the notion that the galaxies are distributed according to fractal pattern. Uh, the book was written in 82. 
uh, I had no new, uh, new data, I did not analyze data. Uh, I looked at data people had analyzed before and there was very strong evidence uh, of fractality, which is completely accepted by everybody. There is no, con no argument that uh, the universe is fractal up to a point, they say locally. Initially, um, the, how to say, the hardcore of cosmologists say that it's fractal up to a scale of 5 megaparsecs, which is 15 uh, million light years, which by cosmic standards is nothing whatsoever. Uh, I thought that they were wrong and argued strenuously against them, uh, and many people, including a particular colleague of mine in Pietro Nero in Rome, spent uh, many years um, collecting data and looking at the evidence. Now everybody believes that the universe is fractal up to depths of 200 or 300 megaparsecs. So the idea of fractality of distribution of galaxies is now accepted under a much broader range. The dispute is only about whether this range continues forever or stops around 200-300 megaparsecs. The difficulty is that uh, nothing much is known after 200-300 megaparsecs, so if nothing is known, you can argue for anything you wish. But uh, <laughs> a, a very big catalog is being published now, and uh, we shall soon know more precisely where it stops, uh, if it stops. I, mean, I refuse to take position on that. I refuse to say it's endless, because I couldn't tell. Pietro Nero thinks it's endless. Uh, other people say it must be finite. But finite, if it's 200, 300 megaparsecs, is a healthy, big length. So, that, now the se next second question is why is it so? And I have an argument for it in my book, uh, which is unfinished, which has been improved since. If it succeeds, it will be a great, a great triumph of explaining the distribution of galaxies. Now, how does that refer to Big Bang, and in particular to the three degrees background radiation? is a, a serious question, so um, it's being investigated very strongly. Uh, but uh, as you realized, uh, I'm faithful for Neumann disciple and uh, prefer to argue about the quality of the fractal model and the kind of fiddling which one must bring to it to make it to fit um, before I ask uh, uh, the deeper questions because, in fact, everybody else is asking deeper questions, so why should I uh, join? Uh, because the deeper questions are taking care of themselves otherwise. Okay. Conservative answer. The last, I think I make this last question, we kind of run over uh, the big answer, maybe. Uh, so besides galaxies, have a lot of questions have to do with the application of fractals to understanding life and uh, biological living things. And I want to, again, throw in a slight editorial on that. And that it seems to me, I mean, if, if nature, and particularly life, is, is very recognizable in fractals, and, and if uh, life has this fractal uh, uh, face on it, then I have to ask the question. I never liked the Darwinian theory. That is a lot of, I never saw anything random going on in biochemistry personally when I took biochemistry. And I thought the word random is a little funny to be thrown in there. And I wonder if we thought a little deeper about that if, if uh, we see fractal patterns and the results of the history of life on the planet, that maybe there's much more beneath the surface here, and uh, maybe the Darwinian thing stuck in old mechanistic Euclidean stuff, and maybe there's a real opportunity to open up and understand the process uh, in a much more interesting way. Well, again, my answer will be in the same style as previous answers. Specifically, fractals are very, very common in life, uh, for example, uh, you all are humans, therefore you all have lungs, and the, st the structure of lung is fractal. It was one of the uh, early uh, points I made in my work, and uh, from what I understand, now it's perfectly standard and accepted view. The authorities in that field are people I know very well, and it's amazing how, um, how precise description of the lung uh, was obtained by anatomists and physicists working together to explore its detailed fractal structure. The kidney is similarly long insofar as the, uh, a certain branching tree takes, uh, is there. The lung is very easy to explain because if you look at the, the way the lung grows uh, during uh, pregnancy, the 
a little tube goes out and divides into two, divides into two again, again, again. It's a branching process. If you have a branching process which is constrained by three-dimensional space to a volume of maybe a liter or two, then uh, the way in which those uh, branches are going to fit together to fill that space is bound to be fractal. It's uh, very simple to establish. Uh, so that's standard. Uh, other aspects of, um, of uh, mammals are more complicated to, to establish fractally. There is an aspect of fractality in the beats of the heart. Uh, one describes a certain uh, so many, a rate of so many beats per, per minute, uh, but in fact, um, if you listen to your own heart, if you are healthy enough to come to this meeting, you will find that your heart is very irregular. It seems to go faster and slower. In fact, a healthy heart is very irregular. In addition to the very well-defined beat, which everybody knows about and measures, there is a kind of background of slow variation, and that background is fractal. It's a very important fact. In judging the health of a, of a, of a, of a heart, that's the important fact. The study of, of chronic illness has many aspects which are very fractal. If I had a, a second life, I would have perhaps uh, gone more into biology than I have uh, from this viewpoint. But uh, the big question of Darwinism is one which uh, I prefer to, uh, to move towards uh, by smaller steps. And uh, I know very well that many of my friends uh, are uh, defenders, or some of them defend a revised version of Darwinism, others attack it very harshly. But um, at this point, I have nothing to add to that discussion. Okay, good. And I will say thank you. Thank you.